on this Wednesday night, a dramatic day in the Commons. I hope that I have the opportunity to speak my truth. But what will the former Attorney General really be able to reveal? And will the government or the law let her say it? I know everyone's mourning. It's seven beautiful, authentic souls. Nova Scotia united in grief for a family facing unimaginable tragedy. Seven children killed in a fire. A moving tribute from a family friend. Now that I know more about vaccines personally, I want to help people understand that they're not dangerous. And as BC fights a measles outbreak, kids are schooling their parents about vaccines. And they're getting the shot on their own. This is The National. The federal Liberals were trying their best to put the SNC-Lavalin controversy behind them, a public apology from the Prime Minister, messages of unity. That is, until Jody Wilson-Raybould made a public statement of her own. Her unexpected comments in the House, yet another twist for the government, already struggling with anonymous allegations of political interference by the Prime Minister's office. Tonight, David Cochran takes us behind the scenes on how the Prime Minister is managing an evolving political crisis. The cracks in the Liberal caucus have been visible ever since the SNC-Lavalin story broke. Uh, I'm going to attend caucus as I always do and uh, we'll see how the conversation goes. Yeah. So everyone met for the first time since and tried to put Humpty Dumpty together again. I apologize to Jody uh, Wilson-Raybould because uh, the I wasn't quick enough to condemn uh, in unequivocal terms, the uh, comments and commentary and cartoons uh, made about her last week. Uh, they were absolutely unacceptable, uh, and I should have done it sooner. Caucus sources say Trudeau also conceded to his MPs that he has not handled this controversy perfectly and apologize that MPs have been left in the dark. Multiple sources say the caucus meeting was largely a call for unity, including from Jody Wilson-Raybould. Sources say that despite everything, Wilson-Raybould reassured MPs she was on the Liberal team and supported the Liberal agenda. Many ministers and MPs emerged to speed walk past reporters, but those who spoke sang a positive tune. Honest and straightforward discussion, great things. Judy's a great person. But as the day wore on, those cracks started to re-emerge. Mr. Erskine Smith. Mr. Erskine Smith. Mr. Long. Mr. Long. Two Liberal MPs, Nathaniel Erskine Smith and Wayne Long, who have a history of breaking ranks, voted with the opposition in an unsuccessful attempt to force a public inquiry. The other member for Vancouver Granville is rising at a point of order. Also, this happened. I would ask that the record show that I abstain from voting on that matter. She um, said she didn't vote because the motion affected her directly. She matter. considers that a conflict. Um, I understand fully that Canadians want to know the truth and want transparency. Privilege and confidentiality are not mine to waive, and I hope that I have the opportunity to speak my truth. <laughs> Just hours after she had pledged loyalty, she brought the opposition to its feet. As to what her truth is, that will have to wait. What do you mean by it when you said you I don't have anything further to say. Thank you. Okay, David, do we have a sense of how liberals are feeling today after another eventful one on the Hill? Well, I have to tell you, after the caucus meeting, the Liberals I spoke with were feeling pretty good about the fact that Jody Wilson-Raybould was there and that she was speaking about team unity. But they all expressed a measure of concern that they just didn't know what she was going to do or say next. And then the abstention happened in the House of Commons vote. So it seems pretty clear there's some sort of an attempt to smooth things over. We saw that with the Prime Minister's apology. But yeah. there are obvious public signs that things maybe aren't going so well. And there's also some private signs, too. Okay, we, we don't obviously hear what happens inside cabinet meetings because that would be <laughs> dangerous, illegal. <laughs> but we have, in spite of all that, learned some details uh, about uh, when Jody Wilson-Raybould made that surprise appearance there yesterday. 
Yeah, we know cabinet ran extra long yesterday, and part of that is because Jody Wilson-Raybould waited for two hours outside the cabinet room while her colleagues debated whether or not to let her in. We have multiple sources telling us that there was deep concern about letting her walk in the cabinet door a week after she walked out of cabinet. The prime minister finally agreed. Now, we don't know exactly what Jody Wilson-Raybould said because of that cabinet confidence, mm -hmm. but we're told she was unapologetic. We saw some of that today, probably with the abstention. And the big question tonight, Rosie, is what is she going to say when she finally testifies at that House of Commons Justice Committee? Okay. David Cochran on this story again for us yeah. tonight in Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you. Wilson Ribbled was clear today she wants to tell her story, but what is decidedly less clear is whether the Liberal government or the law will let her do that. Salima Shivji explains why. But will she speak or won't she? That's the question everyone's been trying to answer. Jody Wilson-Raybould, chief among them. I am seeking counsel on this matter of what I can and cannot say. I understand fully that Canadians want to know the truth and want transparency. She may want to speak out, but a couple of things stand in her way. Let's start with solicitor-client privilege. It's the core ethical standard for lawyers. You don't reveal what you talk about with a client. As Attorney General, she was the government's lawyer, the government her client. So if the government is seeking legal advice from the Attorney General and she provides that advice, um, then, then the government is entitled to treat that as a privileged communication. Even in the face of growing calls from the opposition. Will he waive solicitor-client privilege? Waive any purported solicitor-client privilege and let her speak. <laughs> but what if legal advice wasn't the heart of the conversation? Then it gets complicated because... The Attorney General wears two hats. Attorney General and Justice Minister. Which is where um, cabinet confidentiality uh, kicks in. Anything that's said around this table or between ministers anywhere is a no-go zone, kept secret so ministers are free to debate. The Prime Minister could waive cabinet confidence in this case, and there is uh, possibly a risk that it would be waived in other cases, or that calls to waive cabinet confidence would widen to an, a larger degree of cases. But experts say there is a way she can speak out now. I am a Liberal member of Parliament, thank you. She is protected by parliamentary privilege, so she has the right to stand up in the House and say, well, almost anything, without being sued. That is, if she wants to. I think it's fair to say that she would be acting contrary to uh, her role as a member of the Liberal caucus, uh, inviting quite a bit of controversy. And violating legal ethics, a risk she might not be willing to take. And so Wilson-Raybould is looking to a former Supreme Court justice for advice. So the wait continues. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. And after that dramatic day on Parliament Hill, the Prime Minister travelled to Halifax where he had a planned Liberal Party fundraiser. And ahead of that event, Rosie, Justin Trudeau joined in a show of support for the parents of those seven children killed in a house fire yesterday. Thinking about the kids from the fire we start to die. How they life? Don't know. It's about being a community all together and helping each other out no matter what race, what color, origin, what language you speak, we're all the same, we're all humans at the end. So yeah, we have to be there for each other. Well, you can see and hear the emotion there tonight. The vigil was held in Halifax's main square, organized to give the community a place to unite in their sympathy for the Barho family who had come to Canada as refugees from Syria just over a year ago. Justin Trudeau, as I mentioned, was there, as were hundreds of other people. Their loss is perhaps most acutely being felt in Elms Elmsdale. That's a small community near Halifax that the Barho family called home until a few months ago. As Brett Ruskin shows us, the pain there today runs deep. They were a very much loved family here. For the Barho family, Elmsdale, Nova Scotia was their first refuge in Canada. It's a quiet, tight-knit community. They met Danielle Chasson when they walked into the convenience store where she works and they quickly became friends. What they came from to have, to fight for, and I just don't understand why all seven lives and, and what they're left with. The town's sadness is now on full display. I have four of my own children. I could not imagine losing all seven children. 
The family's new life in Canada was cut short here. Last summer, they moved from Elmsdale to this home in Halifax to be closer to the larger Syrian community. Early yesterday morning, it was an inferno, claiming the lives of all seven of the family's children. The father has serious burns and is now in a medically induced coma. The mother has few physical injuries, but has been calling out the names of her children from her hospital bed. I know everyone's mourning. It's seven beautiful, authentic souls, really. Um, as a mother spending time with that family, it's taught me a great deal about myself and my own parenting, parenting ways, because they were extremely close-knit, well-respected children that helped each other. It's a little different in our culture where we aren't so much like that, so it was very beautiful to see and be around, and which made me want to do better that way. She's left with questions just like everyone else. Where did the fire start? How did it spread? Why couldn't the kids get out? All part of an investigation that continued today. What she does have, though, is a new outlook in the aftermath of this heartbreak. Don't take your life for granted. Hug your children tighter. Say your story. Do your best. Because if anything I've learned through them, is family is unity it is everything it's that's one thing they had right that's one thing they will carry on with me brett ruskin cbc news halifax across this country and as far away as japan canadians are expressing their sympathy in another way too placing stuffed animals on their steps and in their windows I decided to leave stuffed animals outside on my front porch in support and solidarity. Those children had dreams and goals and they had their whole lives ahead of them. So I just wanted to show my support and, uh, you know, let everybody know it's not a, just a community, it's a global community. Yeah, you agree. Being one of the people who witnessed the fire a couple of nights ago, um, I am deeply impacted. I, I truly believe that as a nation, that we're all hurting um, for this dear family that we lost in Canada. Hug your kids tonight when you go to bed. Uh, you never know what can happen. You know, cherish every single moment that you have with them. I just pray that we find healing and that we find peace. An online fundraising campaign for the Barho family has raised more than $390,000 from more than 8,000 donors. Now to a major development in the strange saga of Jesse Smollett. He's the American actor who was the accuser, but tonight he stands accused. Chicago police have charged Smollett, alleging that he orchestrated that seemingly racist and homophobic attack on himself. Kim Brunhuber has the developments. For many who heard Jesse Smollett's account of a horrific attack, it wouldn't have occurred to them that it might not be true. After all, why would the star of a hit TV show make up a story about being violently assaulted by two homophobic racists? But that's exactly what police are now alleging. Late afternoon in a tweet, Chicago police announced Jesse Smollett has now been officially classified as a suspect in a criminal investigation. On January 29th, Smollett, who is black and gay, says he was attacked by two masked men as he was walking home from a Subway sandwich shop in downtown Chicago. He says the men beat him up, threw bleach on him, looped a rope around his neck, and yelled racist and homophobic slurs. Chicago police initially said they were investigating the reported attack as a hate crime. Then, last week, they arrested the two men who were seen in surveillance video. They were released without charges, but later it came out the men were brothers and Smollett knew them. One was an extra on his show. Even more damning, new video. In this store security footage, the two men appear to be buying a red hat and ski masks the day before the alleged attack. The clerk says he's shocked. I looked at the guy and I'm like, wait, I'm the one that showed the guys the mask. So it's still, I'm still in doubt. You do such a disservice when you lie about things like this. Since the first doubts were raised about Smollett's claims, the actor has insisted everything happened exactly as he said. How can you doubt that? Like, how do you, how do you not believe that? It's the truth. Smollett has now added a high-profile Los Angeles-based lawyer to his team, who has represented numerous troubled celebrities, including Michael Jackson and R&B singer Chris Brown. Tonight, police charged Smollett with a felony for filing a false police report. 
if convicted, he could face jail time, but the damage to his reputation would no doubt last much, much longer. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. And tonight, Andrew Smollett's lawyers released a statement saying, of course, their client enjoys the presumption of innocence, but you can bet that all eyes are going to be on that courthouse in Chicago when Smollett appears there tomorrow afternoon. Yeah, no kidding, Rosie. Uh, okay, turning to Vancouver now, where two schools at the center of a measles outbreak have ordered dozens of students and staff to stay home for the next two weeks. Proof of vaccination. Others simply don't believe in it. And that is a problem. First, because with eight confirmed cases, there are concerns the disease could spread. But also, in cases where parents and their kids disagree about whether to get a shot, what then? Renee Filipponi shows us. Who remembers what herd immunity means? In this Surrey classroom, students are being taught about vaccines. It's part of BC's Kids Boost Immunity, an online program with the goal of inoculating the next generation against misinformation. It's really important that we, you know, are teaching kids about evidence-based uh, scientific information so they can make critical choices for themselves. For these kids, getting immunized just makes sense. Getting vaccines can be important because not only are you protecting yourself, you're also protecting other people around you. And that message appears to be getting through, especially with this recent measles outbreak. According to local doctors, some kids are taking their health into their own hands. I've seen people as young as 12 and 14 asking for vaccination because they've been exposed to people that have been vaccinated and it's caused them to question the choices that their parents made for them. I told most of my friends when I got it. 23-year-old um, Maddie Bissett wasn't uh, vaccinated as a child because her mother believes they're dangerous. She got the measles vaccine just this weekend. If there's one thing I could do, it would be to go back when I was 15 and first asking questions and uh, spoken to someone who was more educated on it. It's not clear what the vaccination rate is in BC schools, but it's lower than the health authority would like to see. For example, just over half of the students at this Vancouver elementary school have reported their vaccine status. That's concerning for this parent since 90% of a community needs to be immunized from measles to prevent its spread and protect those people who can't get vaccines. Your decision about your children's vaccination doesn't just affect you and your children, it affects my children too. Two doses of the vaccine are 99% effective at preventing measles. Anyone unsure of their immunization status is encouraged to get a booster. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Now in Canada, the rules around vaccinations are pretty relaxed. They're not mandatory. And while kids in Ontario and New Brunswick do need proof of vaccination to enroll in school, parents can get exemptions, even on the grounds that they simply don't believe in vaccines. But other parts of the world take a much stricter approach. Just last December, Argentina passed a law making vaccinations free and mandatory right across the country. If you want to enroll in school or even renew your passport, you have to show proof you've been vaccinated. Over in Australia, if you're not vaccinated, it'll cost you money. There's a policy of no jab, no pay, meaning parents who refuse to vaccinate their kids have their benefits docked. At least 28 Australian dollars per child every two weeks. And in France, vaccinations are a must. They even recently expanded the number of vaccinations children have to get from 3 to 11. The goal there is to get in line with World Health Organization guidelines, a body which, by the way, puts anti-vaxxers among the top 10 threats to global health, right on the same list as air pollution and climate change. It says a million and a half lives could be saved every year if immunization rates were improved. We're following several other developing stories tonight, starting with the fallout from a CBC Go public investigation. An inquiry has found the big telecom companies are using harmful, misleading, aggressive sale tactics. It's a great day because it's rare that uh, consumers are taken seriously in this country. The CRTC says new rules are needed to stop phone, cable and internet providers from using those practices, especially with seniors, people with disabilities and people whose first language is not English or French. The report includes several recommendations, including better price protection and cooling off periods. All of this after hundreds of workers and another thousand customers sent go public their complaints. 
A Toronto area father charged with killing his 11-year-old daughter has died in hospital. Rupesh Rajkumar sparked an amber alert last week when he didn't return Rhea to her mother following a birthday celebration. Rhea's body was later found in his apartment. Rajkumar died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Ahead tonight on The National, they were some of the most vulnerable preyed upon by priests. You'll hear from sex abuse survivors taking their heartbreaking stories straight to the Vatican. And a race car crash left Robert Wickens paralyzed. Tonight, a small step and a huge moment in his road to recovery. First, though, we know trans fats aren't healthy, but what are companies replacing them with? So what's it got in it now? If you take a look at this right now, you can see three and a half grams of saturated fat. We're making our junk food a little bit less worse. Uh, not necessarily a good thing. When Canada banned artificial trans fats last year, the hope was it would reduce heart disease, preventing up to 12,000 heart attacks over 20 years, according to some researchers. Problem is, what's replacing them may not be much better for your health or for the environment. And as Christine Burak shows us, coming up with new alternatives has its own challenges. Can you bring the cookies over here, please? Baking is a science. Even slight recipe changes can turn light and fluffy into a hockey puck. So we asked Costas Katsimakis what happened when he took trans fats out of the mix. The cookie mixes, uh, they would just stay flat. Our icings would just stay flat. Most pastries need solid fat to lift them up and create that layered, silky, smooth bite. When saturated fats like butter and lard took a beating over health concerns, trans fats like shortening and margarine took over. Turns out they were even less healthy. That's why we just started going back to butter and making our, our lives as, uh, as easy as possible. So this aisle has already changed. Trans fats have also disappeared from most prepackaged processed foods, making old fats new again. So what's it got in it now? If you take a look at this right now, you can see three and a half grams of saturated fat. Unlike the bakery, nothing here contains butter. Almost everything is loaded with inexpensive palm oil. Palm oil is a highly saturated fat, even though it's a, it's a plant-based fat. But environmentally, palm is highly controversial. It's linked to large-scale deforestation. Still, food makers hope trans fat-free leads to healthier sales. Nutritional scientists see it differently. We're making our junk food a little bit less worse. Uh, not necessarily a good thing. Notice this liquid oil here. Food chemists can't turn a muffin into a salad, but they're trying to come up with healthier fats. This could be used to solidify any oil. They figured out how to solidify unsaturated fats like olive oil using water. So this is the one that is made only with oil, water, and a natural emulsifier. And this can be used to make cookies, muffins, cakes. But the cost keeps large food manufacturers from biting. Uh, yes, somebody has to take the first step. Butter does make things delicious. It's sustainable, but expensive and calorie heavy. No doubt another new, perhaps healthier solid fat will come along. What do you think is next? I wish I knew. I, I really, really wish I knew. We'll see in a couple of years. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Ahead tonight on National, they're afraid the world has forgotten about their sons. Chris Brown speaks to the families of Ukrainian sailors imprisoned in Russia. First, though, as the Vatican prepares to confront clergy abuse, we speak to survivors from a school in Italy where young people were especially vulnerable. On the eve of an unprecedented conference on clergy abuse, the Pope set a contentious tone by criticizing those who constantly accuse the church. The Pope asks, who in the Bible is called the great accuser? Who? The crowd responds, the devil. I can't hear you, says the Pope. They shout more loudly. It's just one sign this groundbreaking four-day conference may not be enough for abuse victims. Today, a dozen of them met with Vatican officials and left disappointed that the Pope didn't attend. And it would seem that the Pope, once again, is 
is giving the two fingers to survivors and to child protection everywhere. They're calling for the Pope to declare zero tolerance for abuse across the church and to dismiss bishops who took part in cover-ups. The CBC's Thomas Dagla is in Rome tonight. But first, he stopped in Verona to meet with a particular group that for decades was preyed upon by priests. And their story is especially disturbing because of what made them so vulnerable. Verona, a place so picturesque, it served as a muse for Shakespeare twice. A city with much darker stories, too, the kind poets didn't write about. Nightmares kept hidden by the Catholic Church. Those stories are shared nowadays at this community center for deaf people. We asked uh, for a lot of years uh, justice, but we haven't justice. Many here were physically and sexually abused by priests. This is their safe space, decked out to show their anger toward the clergy on one side of the room and the life that came after abuse on the other. <laughs> Alessandro Ventini was repeatedly attacked by three priests throughout his school years. Do you still pray? No, no, no prayer, no, no. He remembers all too clearly the one he calls the worst of all. Boom, boom, boom. I was hit with a stick again and again, he says. It hurt. Then he sodomized me. I yelled. For me, it was like dying. Horror stories like his stayed trapped for decades behind these walls, the building that once housed the Antonio Provolo Institute. It was a Catholic-run school where priests preyed on boys, knowing their screams wouldn't be heard because all students were deaf. Seventeen victims came forward for an investigation, but dozens more are believed to have suffered abuse here at the Provolo Institute between the 1950s and 1980s. Journalist Paolo Tisadri brought the story to light in 2009 after a cover-up that had lasted decades. I was stunned, to say the least, when the victims told me what had happened, but they were extremely courageous, he says. And it didn't end there. Deaf girls attending the school two doors down also suffered abuse. Every week at church, Alda Franchetto says a priest groped her and masturbated. The nuns knew exactly what was going on, she says, but they didn't say anything. In 2010, the Vatican launched an investigation into the Provolo scandal, calling on Monsignor Giampietro Mazzoni to look into it. But he, in turn, hired a civil magistrate, rather than a clergyman, to handle the sexual abuse case. We've seen what results come from the methods of the past, he says, which entailed sweeping the dust under the carpet. He says only two living priests were found guilty, though neither one was sent to jail and neither lost his status as Catholic priest. So feeling like they never got justice, abuse survivors have made props demanding pedophile priests be kicked out of the church. You're going to wear that in, in Rome. They're taking their campaign to the Pope's Global Summit this week, the event supposed to help stop the kind of abuse they suffered. The least they want now, they say, is compensation. And I hope is the beginning to another era. But we don't know. Wait and see. Indeed, victims around the world will be hoping for change. Perhaps finally a path toward the closure that's been such a long time coming. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Verona, Italy. Now on last night's National, we heard from Evelyn Corkmass, an indig indigenous woman who attended a notorious Indian residential school in Ontario. She said she was gang raped by boys in her community after they had been abused by priests and nuns. Today, in Rome, she demanded compensation from the Pope that Canadian Catholic groups had promised as part of a residential school settlement. I would also like him to release these documents of abuse and let us rewrite the Canadian history, the true Canadian history. Catholic groups ran more than half of Canada's residential schools.
Our Thomas Dagla also had a chance to speak with Canadian Cardinal Mark Ouellette. As a senior Vatican official, he meets regularly with the Pope, and he says he sees great promise in the Conference on Clergy Abuse. I think it is a great sign of hope for the victims of sexual abuse in the Church, because it is really a sign of that their pain is uh, acknowledged and uh, that uh, there is a, a real um, a will to change, not only in, in some area, but in the whole church. Pope Francis has admitted to mishandling the issue of clergy abuse, both as Archbishop of Argentina, then as Pope. The conference that starts tomorrow with 190 church leaders from around the world is being seen as his effort to set things right. Up next on The National, are they criminals locked behind bars or hostages of the Kremlin? Chris Brown speaks to the families of Ukrainian sailors trapped in prison in Russia. And a little later, the story behind a moment of compassion is our moment of the day. He walked in there and they just, you know, cheered and clapped and fist bump and, you know, chanted his name. It was just, it was crazy and awesome. was a great answer to our problems and our concerns. Emotions ran high today as the Ontario government discussed autism funding. Conservative MPP Randy Hillier said, yada, 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 and a group of parents felt it was directed dismissively at them. For that, he's been suspended from the party's caucus by the Premier Doug Ford, but Hillier says the comment was intended for the NDP critic. If anybody believed that I was saying that to to families, I, I would deeply apologize for that. Hillier added, he's not sure what the suspension means, but he's confident the issue can be resolved. The United We Roll convoy is headed home after two days of protests on Parliament Hill. The rallies were to support the energy industry, but some people had a different agenda expressing anti-immigration sentiments. The protesters did not get the meeting they wanted with the Prime Minister, but say they're planning to be back in the summer. A massive fire in the Bangladeshi capital of Dhaka has killed at least 56 people and left dozens more injured. The death toll is expected to climb. The blaze breaking out in a building that was used as a chemical warehouse. Firefighters have been working to control the flames, their efforts hampered by an inadequate water supply. It's not clear what caused the fire. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine rarely makes headlines, but it has taken more than 13,000 lives over five years. A hot war on a slow boil. Russian-backed separatists fight in Ukraine's east. The words of a so-called ceasefire agreement belied by bullets. And while Ukraine's army uses U.S.-supplied weapons to battle those separatists on land, its navy runs drills preparing for more confrontation at sea. Ukrainians have reason to fear a Russian naval attack. Three months ago, tensions in the Black Sea ignited a full-blown international crisis. Russian ships fired on and then seized three smaller Ukrainian vessels. The sailors aboard, arrested and taken to Russia, where they remain effectively political prisoners. Our Chris Brown met some of the sailors' families, and in this dispatch from Ukraine, they expressed concern for their sons and their country. Russian prosecutors say these Ukrainian sailors are criminals, but their families say they're more like hostages. The man on the left in the cage is Yuri Bezyazichny. On the far right is Sergei Tuliba. They were in a Moscow courtroom pleading to be freed. But the judges hired and working on behalf of Russia's secret police would have nothing of it. As they were being marched back to prison, Yuri's traumatized mother Luba broke through the security perimeter <laughs> to hug her son for the first time in months, but it was over in seconds. Sergei's mom Alina was overcome with emotion after seeing her son as a prisoner. <laughs> The young men were captured by Russia in late November after this now notorious naval confrontation near the disputed Crimean Peninsula. 
It saw vessels rammed, shots fired, and 24 Ukrainian crew members seized. They've been imprisoned, now pawns in a much larger global confrontation between the Putin government and the West. Until now, their families have stayed silent, fearing reprisals against their sons. But as the weeks in captivity turned to months, Alina, Luba and their families agreed to talk to us. An hour or so drive from the contested peninsula of Crimea is Kahovka, Sergei's hometown, where Luba and her husband Roman live. None of the 24 sailors are allowed to call their families. 300 kilometers to the south is Odessa, where Alina lives. Мы сюда приезжаем каждую неделю, потому что у него в доме растут цветы, нам надо их поливать. She brought our crew and some of Yuri's other family members to Yuri's apartment. Вот его кроссовки лежат, все сложено, красиво, ровненько. We found everything just as he left it that morning in November. Тут у него идеальный порядок, так у нас всегда, чистота, все. All very neat, tidy. Все там обувь, все, все снизу, кверху. Тут у него любая девочка. <laughs> her pride in her son is matched only by the anger she feels at his captors. Odessa is the headquarters of Ukraine's small Black Sea Navy, now down to just a handful of vessels. The men sailed from here. Luba and Roman say their son told them he was taking his ship to a new base in the Sea of Azov, which meant passing under Russia's new bridge to Crimea. But no one expected it to be anything but a routine assignment. То есть никакой угрозы нас маленькая Украина. И Россия это правильно. Что она может навредить? Чем мы можем навредить? Если бы просто они просто выполняли задачу отогнать Мариуполь корабли. Всего лишь на все перегнать корабли. Ну и в чем тут угроза? Какая здесь угроза была? Даже не понимаю. Это же он там был. Сергей was on the tugboat. Yuri was on one of two artillery ships. This widely circulated video was shot by sailors on the Russian warships that intercepted them. The Russian Navy ordered the Ukrainians to stop. When they didn't, they rammed the tug. Stop, машина. И слышно ответ есть кэп. Это когда говорит мой сын. Я когда вот это услышала, у меня внутри все оборвалось. У меня я не могла ни днем, ни ночью не спать. The Russians blocked their passage under the bridge, forcing the Ukrainians to turn around, which is when the Russian Navy opened fire. Это была самая страшная ночь когда потом уже сообщили, что есть только раненые, никто не погиб, но все равно я еще была, все равно я переживала. Tragedy had already struck this family. Alina's husband, an officer in Ukraine's army, was killed last year in the conflict in eastern Ukraine. At a gathering of international media a month after the sailors were seized, Russia's president stood his ground. Vladimir Putin laid the blame on Ukraine, suggesting the country's leaders sacrificed their own sailors to whip up anti-Russian anger on the eve of a Ukrainian election. I see in the political circles that no one died. 
рассчитывали, что кто-то из них погибнет. Вот. Но, слава богу, этого не случилось. Ну, Россия виновата, однозначно, потому что это наша территория. Они проходили через Крымский, по Закрымским полуостровам, через пролив, Керченский пролив, отгоняли корабли. Это же наша территория была. Кто забрал у нас территорию Крыма? Они же и забрали. The sailors could face a six-year sentence for illegally entering Russian territory. One of the sailors' lawyers, Ilya Novikov, can't say when he thinks they'll get out. So this case should be treated as exceptional one, and uh, this provides us good grounds to believe that Russia breaks international law by putting these people on trial the way they uh, they doing it right now. Luba and Roman worry their sons will be forgotten as the world's outrage over Russia's behavior moves on to some other issue, and that's why they wanted to talk to us. I think he's a hero, he's a hero. Even when it's hard, and even when I cry, I'm going to cry, and 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 I'm going to cry. Это очень ужасное чувство, когда ты знаешь, что твой ребенок ни в чем не виноват. Согласилась на это интервью только для того, чтобы люди во всем мире знали эту несправедливость по отношению к нашим детям. Their anguished wait for something to happen seems set to stretch into the spring. Until he's home, Alina says she'll come to Yuri's apartment to water his plants. And Roman and Luba will keep setting his place at their dinner table. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Kahovka, Ukraine. There's no end in sight for the sailors' plight or for the war in Ukraine, but Ukraine's president said today he supports the idea of a UN peacekeeping mission at the front, and that is an option the Kremlin has been open to in the past. The moment of the day is up next on The National, but first. In case you missed it, Canadian IndyCar driver Robert Wickens just passed a major milestone. Wickens was able to stand right into the arms of his fiancée, Carly Woods. It's so crazy that you couldn't do this before. It's hard to stress how huge an achievement that is. Six months after a crash that broke his spine. Hey, everybody. Awesome. And left him paralyzed. Um, I don't know what the future holds for me. It's going to be a very long road. Wickens and Woods documented each step on that road, an intimate portrait of pain, determination, and devotion. I'm riding the bike. His family and friends always close by as he trained not just to heal, but to race again. He said in today's post that he knew he could stand for a full week, but wanted to surprise his bride-to-be. Look, you're standing! We're dancing. His goal? To dance by this September at their wedding. Hi, I'm Sarah McLaughlin, host of the 2019 Juno Awards. What do you get when you take green beer, an arena full of excited fans, and live performances from some of Canada's hottest acts? It's not a joke, I'm really asking. Don't miss a moment of the biggest night in Canadian music. Join the celebration as the country's greatest musicians hit the stage. Live from London, Ontario, the 2019 Juno Awards. St. Patrick's Day on CBC. Oh. So, uh, Pee Wee Hockey Tournament on Sunday was a real challenge for Archie Wibley. He's eight years old from New Hampshire, plays goalie, and he faced an absolute barrage. Now, eventually, Archie's team lost 10 to 0. But there's a lot more to this story than just the final score. From the stands, a Canadian team, the Dartmouth Whalers, watched Archie play, and what happened next is tonight's moment. He was making save after save after save. The team from the Dartmouth Whalers had a game directly after him. And so they were getting ready to, you know, they were all suited up in their gear and they were standing behind the glass. And our boys um, very quickly realized just how hard he was working. He was making save after save. 
And I could hear her talking to him, like just, you know, good job and supporting him. And she was using his name. And I said, is his name Archie? And she said, yes. I said, you must be his mom. And I told the boys what his name was, at which point they started cheering his name. They started just cheering for him and chanting his name and banging on the glass and stuff. It was just so great. So, of course, our boys um, go back in the dressing room to get dressed. And... Uh, they they were they were still in there chanting his name and I asked him if he'd like to come in and meet our team. He walked in there and they just you know cheered and clapped and fist bump and you know chanted his name. It was just it was crazy and awesome. It just really restores my faith in human goodness. No kidding. I, you know, as uh, someone who spent a lot of time at rinks when my kids were a lot younger, I, I, two things come to mind. First of all, to be an eight-year-old goalie at a tournament game where your team is clearly outmatched, that's got to be the loneliest place for a kid to be. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, that Pee Wee team, the Dartmouth Whalers, they're 11 and 12 years old. I don't think there are a lot of Pee Wee teams that would have responded the way these kids did. And, uh, and, and you know, everyone involved in the story we've seen was genuinely touched by it. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but 10 nothing, which is what the end game was, is, is that's a very high score for hockey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but Archie did manage to stop a lot more shots. So <laughs> I was very impressed with that whole story. Yeah, no, and, and Ian, I, you know, I will say, I think you nailed it right on because any, anyone who has the, the grit and resolve to play goalie, period, uh, has my respect because, you know, on the good days, it's got to feel good, but on the bad days, it's got to be so tough. Uh, Archie, if you are watching, a, uh, it's past your bedtime, so you should probably go to bed. But B, uh, keep playing, keep smiling, keep getting better. You're amazing. That's the National for this February 20th. Have a good night. Good night.